$47 oil, $5,300 copper. Ed Morris, head of commodities at City, gives his call on commodities as the coronavirus zaps demand. The truth about batteries. The future of EVs depends on how far the car can go in a single charge. Who's winning? Who's losing? Big oil? Meet big tech. CEO of Baker Hughes, Lorenzo Simonelli, talks about how he's using digital to transform his business. I'm Alex Steele. Welcome to Bloomberg Commodities Edge. 30 minutes focus on the companies, the physical assets, and the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. First, we kick it off with Spot On. It's our take on the big story, and today the spotlight is on oil. Crude collapsing as the coronavirus spreads in China. Crude, jet fuel, natural gas, gasoline demand all affected. A BP CFO weighed in on the virus's impact. What you're seeing in terms of short-term impact to oil price is the effect of coronavirus, where the market, we think right now coronavirus could have an impact of anywhere from 300,000 barrels a day to 500,000 barrels a day, which will soften demand up. And then I think all eyes then lead to OPEC as to whether OPEC will then look to rebalance the market to get back in the 60-65 range. Joining me now, Regina Mayer at KPMG, Global Head of Energy, plus Ed Morris, Global Head of Commodity Research at Citigroup. Citi just cut its first quarter oil price target by $15 to $47. Ed, good to see you. Good to be with you. Walk me through the modeling and how you got to $47. So we got there by looking at what the direct demand impact was on China. China, we looked at gasoline demand, diesel demand, jet fuel demand, add them all up. Uh, we have a base of around 7.4 million barrels a day. We took good, what I... I think are some good guesses at what the impact is on all of them. And we came up with, for the immediate period of time, 4 million barrels a day. And we think that's the hit through the first couple of weeks of February. If things start to improve, we think the hit in the last two weeks of February will be 2 million a day. And gradually, as we get through 2Q, we'll see, we'll see demand rising. But meanwhile, inventory is building up. And that inventory is going to weigh on prices. There are a whole bunch of other lumpy things at work. But uh, we come to a little bit of a larger cut in demand than, uh, than the BP CEO did and, mm -hmm. uh, and a little bit lower price by the end of all of this. So then I guess the question is, what happens to companies, particularly here in the U.S.? Regina, uh, you're, you're in Houston, so weigh in on sort of what companies do if we get to 47 for three months, putting them right at some sort of uh, where they sold some production forward. Well, we're hoping that we don't get to that. But you're, definitely this is the largest demand destruction event that the industry has faced since the financial crisis. I think that the industry is optimistic that we're seeing some signals that the demand destruction won't be as drastic as what Ed is, is um, forecasting, but we don't know yet. I take the fact that the market hasn't re overly responded to OPEC's meeting results as an, indi an indication that perhaps we're at the peak of of where the fear is and that maybe this is no longer an open-ended risk situation and perhaps the demand destruction is more closely aligned with what BP's projections are. But at this point, we don't know. Well, I'm glad you brought up OPEC, Ed, because uh, how much would OPEC have to cut to sort of either stabilize prices, not get to 47? What do you think? Yeah, so uh, there are two questions. How much do they cut and when do they cut? And the news so far out of Vienna is they're not cutting yet. Uh, or we'll wait and see what happens from a, de a decision in the Kremlin. Uh, on the assumption that they cut starting the second quarter, we don't think that's enough to really reverse things. We think the hit is greater than that. Uh, there's been a hit on other things, other, other moving parts at work. We have U.S. inventories that have built faster and, and deeper than anyone thought they were going to, and that also weighs on the market, and we'll have a bigger inventory overhang uh, impacting the market. So uh, our take on it is that, yeah, financial flows have been at work. We think the financial flows have been a little bit overly optimistic about a V-fall and a V-shaped recovery, mm -hmm. and we think it's really unlikely to be that way. We think the very fact of an inventory build is going to make any recovery a much longer U-shaped recovery going forward. And all of this also impacting uh, the curve as well as spreads. And one that I wanted to show to you guys is Brent 1 to 12 month. And you can see it really slipped into, into contango where prices today are cheaper uh, than prices in the future. Uh, Regina, when you take a look at something like that and you're a business and you have to make business decisions, how do you do that right now? 
Well, I think they have to take the slow and steady wins the race type of an approach. I mean, capital budgets were formulated. As I've said, I, th I think we actually felt like we were achieving a bit of a mini renaissance in Q4 of last year. And you started to see independent oil produ producer stock prices come back. This is a significant hit that we're going to take in Q1 and for sure in Q2. But the industry in Houston is optimistic that things will recover. And by the end of Q2, we'll see things stabilize in the mid 50s and perhaps higher uh, or low 60s as we've seen in the past for WTI and Brent. Ed, do you agree low 60s on a rebound potential or well, higher? Well, I, I, I think that's wishful thinking. I had that wishful thinking myself. <laughs> I'm yeah. waiting for one very critical element of, of the, fourth, the last quarter results and the year results. What happened to the cost of production globally? in the U.S. and elsewhere. We, we've seen the cost of production on a dramatic slide since 2014. Uh, the last year that we have is really 2018 data. 2018 data showed us that we had average costs of finding and developing oil reaching a peak a couple of years ago at $30 a barrel and we're at $12 a barrel uh, uh, last year, mm. or the year before last. Uh, if that ha doesn't go up, that's really traditionally, historically, econometrically, co uh, co kind of coincidental with, um, maybe it's cause, causal with a fair market value of around 45 to $50 a barrel. Oh, so wow. we think the median price as it relates to the cost structure of the industry should be a lot lower than that $60 wonderland that we and others have been thinking about two years ago. Regina, you want to respond to that? Well, I, I hope it's not a wonderland. I, I, I can't get into a debate. And it's clearly uh, very steeped in the numbers. But we are more optimistic. We do recognize here in Houston that this is a significant demand destruction event. I think that we will see perhaps a little bit of curtailment of budgets, a continued strong focus on OPEX and OPEX improvements. Mm -hmm. But we are hoping that demand recovers uh, and that people start to go in and out of China again. So this one thing, we talk a lot about demand, so Ed, I want to focus on supply for a second. Libya has the lowest supply right now since 2011. How does that wind up supporting the market if China sort of comes back faster than people think? Uh, well, it's, it's supporting the market in a, in a way already. The spread between Brent and Dubai has, has widened, stayed wider. We thought it was going to be wide because of the IMO 2020 very technical mm -hmm. specification mm -hmm. standards. Uh, it didn't really blow out. We have less heavy crude in the market. Uh, so, yeah, I think Libya has had an impact. It's had an impact on spreads, not, not on, uh, on flat price. And as on spreads, as you indicated, if it were really going to have an impact, it would keep that Brent structure in backwardation. And it is, as you said, flipped into contango. All right, fair point. All right, Regina Mayer from KPMG, thank you very much. Ed Morris of City will be sticking with me. So recently, I traveled to Florence, Italy for Baker Hughes' annual meeting where oil was actually on the back burner and said all the conversation was about LNG and the energy transition. We know that the world needs more energy. Mm -hmm. And as you see the growing population, as you see the move from poverty to the middle class, that's not going to stop. What we're doing is actually enabling that energy transition by looking at the capabilities of the energy mix becoming more cohesive and working together. Commodities Edge. Time now for the data dig. We're going to delve deep into the market trends of the week. Oil demand still looks weak. You got total product demand was down by nearly 1 million barrels of oil a day. And if you're an oil company, it's been a really tough couple weeks for you. And I do want to take a look at ConocoPhillips because there was one positive here. So uh, this blue line here shows their free cash flow uh, after CapEx, then the white line after dividends, and then their operating free cash flow after buybacks. It was only $532 million in the red. That was actually a positive. Conoco was also able to raise production, replace reserves, and boost shareholder payouts. And one big casualty of the coronavirus is jet fuel demand. You got airlines forced to cancel some flights that actually pushed the Asian market into contango. Uh, Singapore jet fuel swaps for March were 29 cents a barrel cheaper than for April or earlier this week. And that's the biggest discount in about 10 months. So now let's get into the ring. You got equity investors versus copper traders. Ed Morse of Citi is still with me. We've seen a rally in the equity market, yet not at all when it comes to copper, really. Ed, how much more downside do you see for copper? Yeah, well, we see about $400 or maybe more downside. We think the uh, 
the, the little upside that we've seen in copper is, uh, is transitory. I think it's based on two factors. One is the euphoria that affect, affected all markets, mm -hmm. lifted commodities if they were all in free fall. Um, and uh, there are some people in the investor community still expecting that the recovery will be V-shaped. Uh, the other factor, of course, is the uh, force majeure that have been called by uh, Chinese uh, Chinese importers. Uh, we have it in copper. We have it in LNG. We have it in a whole bunch of agricultural materials. We have ports that can't d discharge uh, whatever the cargoes are. We have that backing up on the supply chain back to whatever the port of export is. We have freight rates that are plummeting as mm -hmm. a result of all of this. Uh, but people actually took the force measure as a bullish sign. Uh, and that, that we think is going to unravel and we think mm. uh, the fall that we saw uh, is going to continue, and even if you look at that recent rally, take a look at the last 20 days, and prices are still down everywhere except maybe sugar and cocoa. And gold. And gold, of so, course. So, uh, yeah, it's a totally different story. Had that safe haven appeal well before this even yeah. happened. Uh, what kind of upside do you see when? How do we get to 2000? Well, the 2000 we think is in the medium term. We mm -hmm. think it's plausible in 21, depending on what central banks are doing and what. Uh, uh, in, in two respects. One is what are they doing buying gold and what are they doing in terms of rates. But we see the structure uh, for the future for gold being you know, quite good. Uh, we're looking at a, a, a $15.75 uh, price by the end of the first half mm -hmm. and uh, a $16.25 price by the end of the year. On the way to 2000 potentially in 2021. So when you take a look at, say, the metals, whether you're dealing with gold or whether you're dealing with uh, a copper, even aluminum, I would say, or nickel, how's positioning? Like, how much of sort of the sell-off that we've seen has to do with where we were positioned? Like, you had managers who were really light on gold and really heavy, say, on copper. Uh, so we think that that's exactly what we've seen. We've seen a sell-off of the length. That sell-off of the length has a way to go. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the oil length wasn't that long. It was kind of a neutral territory when when the sell-off began. So p positioning uh, has gone from neutral to short, but we think there's going to be you know, more short uh, or, uh, or reduction of the length to go. Uh, we won't see a V-shaped v recovery like you say, but if we see sort of a U, I mean, does copper really have a, like, what, what's the upside then? Yeah, we think the upside is quite, quite substantial. We, uh, we have a $6,300 target price for yeah. next year. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to have a $6,700 target price for next year. Uh, we think the end year is going to be in the $6,000 range. So okay. we think the second half of the year could be quite strong. And in copper, unlike oil, uh, unlike iron ore, uh, the market really is at the point where uh, the incre any increase in demand at the margin is going to turn to higher cost material. And there are in the market really some supply problems mm -hmm. ahead. There are mm -hmm. labor problems ahead. The copper market is not exactly like the oil and gas markets. Fair point, particularly uh, in Chile. All right, Ed, really great to see you. Thank you so much, with you. Ed Morse of City. And time now for the note of the week, and it does focus on LNG. It's part of what we were just talking about. A CNUC declares a force majeure, which means it won't take delivery of some LNG cargoes because of circumstances beyond its control. Typically, you see producers using that, and that means that LNG ships hold cargoes for longer, increasing shipping costs and weighing on global natural gas prices. And this leads me to the note from Tudor Pickering. They wrote this week, we do expect to see a significant number of bankruptcies if gas prices stay this low. What you're starting to see is the forward curve not only in 2020 but in 2021 plus has moved to such a low price that companies, and they're talking about companies in the U.S., are not able to drill within cash flow to hold drilling steady. A pretty big call there. All right, coming up, Lorenzo Simonelli, Baker Hughes CEO. We discuss that next. I'm Bloomberg Commodities Edge. I'm Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Time now for the BNF Brief, which gives in-depth analysis on clean energy, advanced transport, commodities, and emerging technologies. And today, we're looking at battery performance. So the key for people buying more EVs is cheaper batteries. And last year, BNF found that average prices were down uh, to $156 kilowatt per hour. That's down 87 percent since 2010. Joining me now from San Francisco is James Firth uh, from Bloomberg NEF. How did we get battery prices reduced so much in nine years? 
Well, key to this has really been the scale that we've seen in the industry. So we've seen the electric vehicle industry scaling massively, but we've also got other sectors like energy storage, so stationary battery storage, uh, and the electrification of commercial vehicles. So that's been one key factor. The other one alongside that has been the introduction of new cell chemistries, which have cheaper raw material and manufacturing costs. And I mentioned EVs in particular, but what other industries can use these batteries that can now benefit from these lower packs? Yeah, so increasingly, as I mentioned, you know, we're seeing industries like the stationary energy storage industry electrifying. We're also seeing um, increasing electrification of uh, electric buses. In the US, we're seeing, in particular, school buses becoming electrified. Uh, and as prices continue to fall, we'll see more sectors opening up. How much more can prices actually fall from this point? That's a really good question. Um, so from the work that we've done, we forecast that by around 2024, battery pack prices will on average be below $100 per kilowatt hour. And this is a really important metric because it's because when you get below this price that you start seeing mass market price parity between electric vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles. If we look further out than that, by 2030, you expect battery pack prices could be below uh, about $60 per kilowatt hour. But the route to getting to, to those prices is still not clear. There's a number of technologies that could be introduced. But still, whoa, would be my reaction to that. All right, I James Firth of Bloomberg NEF, thank you very much. All right, now we turn to Commodity in Chief, where we focus on one executive in the commodity world, and today it's Lorenzo Simonelli from Baker Hughes. First, a closer look at his company. Oil field services are the evil stepchild of oil investing, underperforming crude prices, the S&P, and its oil peers. They are all rethinking their business models to account for a world of capital discipline from U.S. shale producers, peak production fears in the Permian, a falling rig count, lower oil prices, and climate change. Enter Baker Hughes. It's placing its future on the energy transition. Here's how. Liquefied natural gas, LNG. It makes a turbo machinery that's needed to build a liquefaction facility where natural gas is turned into or out of liquid. And carbon capture. It makes products and services to help customers monitor and reduce emissions. The bulk of the revenue still comes from upstream, and that might come in weak, but turbo machinery and process solutions revenue could grow at least 20% this year. It's also committed to its own business to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. It's the only major oil services player in the LNG space, and hopes are it can stay the leader and win over investors while doing it. I recently caught up with Lorenzo Baker, who's CEO, at the company's annual meeting in Florence, and we talked about the power of digital. Our distinguishing factor is, when you look at our digital solutions business, we have also the hardware and software aspects. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's Give me very an example of that. What does that really mean? So what that means is, you've actually got the sensors from a hardware perspective, and then you've got the software relative to condition monitoring. Mm -hmm. So we are, I think, the gold standard when you think of uh, condition monitoring through Bentley Nevada, and you've got uh, the System 1, we just released the Orbit 60. So these capabilities allow uptime, uh, allow the reliability and efficiency to be there for our pieces of equipment. That's very different than some of our peers who really are going from a geological reservoir perspective. They don't have as much on the equipment side. Meaning so that, that they focus on like what rock you want to drill best. Correct. Versus... They focus on one area. Our portfolio is much broader. Um, how much money do you think that uh, your clients are going to spend on digital going forward? You know, I, I think they're going to continue to invest. Uh, to put a number on it is mm. difficult. Uh, but you look at all the surveys and the interactions we have with our customers is, you know, you can get a very nice return by focusing on digital. Growth rate then? If you, can, if you don't have a number, like growth rate? Look, we expect our, again, we said it before, we expect our digital solutions business overall to be uh, GDP plus one to two percent. If you look at the digital component of it, you would expect that to grow at a faster rate mm -hmm. just because it's coming from a lower base. But we need a few years to actually make it scalable. Which one are you most jazzed about? I know it's like picking between kids, but like if there's one that you think is really going to take off that hasn't been yet adopted that you're most excited about, what would it be? Digital transformation. Uh, the ability to really take the data that's out there, make the algorithmic sense and predictive anticipated results. Outcomes are what matters. And is that more to um, 
like you're going to replace equipment before you know before it breaks is it uh knowing there's going to be a leak before there's a leak is it, is it that it's that mm -hmm. but then if you think about being able to continuously drive production without stoppage mm -hmm. downtime is your worst enemy non-productive time also in processes the inefficiencies that happen because there is stoppage in the handover we've got an opportunity now by taking a digital view to actually bring down that MPT, and that's gonna enable higher production. From where you sit, do you feel like US shale has peaked for the oil services sector? You know, there's uh, different scenarios that people are looking at. Uh, you know, 2020, we see North America EMP spend down double digit. Um, I think most of us see that within the industry. As you look at um, production, it will vary by basin. And uh, I think right now it's more an aspect of let's continue to drive productivity. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how this year unfolds. But there's clearly challenges that are emerging on the North America side. So I hear that says too early to call a peak, but dot, dot, dot. I would say too <laughs> early to call a peak and it's going to vary by basin. Mm -hmm. But there are some challenging times in North America. Uh, can you give me a, some insight? I'm trying to get a good read on are the wells that people are drilling today better or worse? than they drilled a year ago in whatever capacity, whether their IP rate is higher, but then their decline rate is deeper. Do you have any insight into that yet? So again, the variation by basin is tremendous. And I think uh, the EMPs would be in a better position to give that to you. Mm -hmm. Our focus with them is uh, drive towards productivity. And so how can you actually drill a faster well? Mm -hmm. How can you bring it online faster? And if you look at our portfolio, again, we're much more on the production side. And so we're less sensitive to some of the aspects of the EMP spend decline. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll outperform uh, the market from that perspective. But productivity is the name of the game. That was my interview with Lorenzo Simonelli, Baker Hughes, CEO. All right, so do you want to fight global warming? Because then you got to think before hitting send on your next email. So researchers say emails and other data stored on servers are actually contributing to global warming despite energy efficient upgrades. By 2025, each connected person will have almost 5,000 digital interactions every day. That's about one in every 17 seconds. Data centers now consume about 2% of the world's electricity. That could reach 8% by 2030. There is really just one thing on my commodity radar next week, and that is BP's Investor Day on Wednesday. I will be sitting down with Bernard Looney. He's the new CEO of BP. Today is his first full day at the helm of the company. It's going to be a huge transformation as the whole industry shifts in the middle of the energy transition. That does it now for Bloomberg Commodities Edge. Catch me every Thursday at 1 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg.